So when we come back to Tawheed al-Ibadah, worshipping Allah, by maintaining His unity in that worship, we do so in the way that the companions of the Prophet Muhammad did. We do not invent or introduce new ways of worship. As some people, for example, they want to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet Muhammad So they say, well, you know, this is something good. They may even bring a verse from the Quran. They will say, Allah said in the Quran, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayyu alladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. They bring this verse out. And you say, well, what does it say? Celebrate the Prophet's birthday there. You see, it's there, it's there. This is what it means. It's their interpretation. Right? Their interpretation. The point is, that the companions of the Prophet Muhammad didn't understand that verse that way. And that's why they never celebrated his birthday. And he himself didn't understand that verse that way, and he didn't celebrate his birthday. And the early generations didn't celebrate his birthday. It wasn't until some 400 years after the time of Prophet Muhammad that his birthday began to be celebrated in Egypt in the Fatimid Shiite rule. In the Fatimid Shiite dynasty in Egypt, the celebration of the Prophet's birthday began. So we say this is not legitimate. Some people say, well, okay, leave that aside. Just the idea of celebrating his birthday, what are we doing in the celebration? We are only remembering Rasulullah, we're asking Allah to bless him. You know, these are all good things. We remember his sirah, his life, and all this. These are all good things. You say this is not good in Islam? Yes, these things are good things. But to combine them on that day, every year you have now created something new in the religion. This is bidah. Similarly, we could ask, if somebody suggested to you, you, see, you have to understand bid'ah sometimes it involves something completely new like the idea of the birthday celebration because we don't really have any precedence for it at all in Islam but bid'ah may actually have precedence in the religion itself wherein a person takes something like after prayers raising your hand in dua after every prayer people raise their hands in dua people say well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with it? Prophet Muhammad said that Allah does not like or he is shy that anyone would raise their hands in dua and that they would put their hands down without fulfilling their wish, their desire. Isn't that implied that we should raise our hands in dua? Prophet Muhammad raised his hands in the dua of istisqa. The prayer to seek rain. He raised his hand so high, that's how he did it, you could, they could see his armpits. Say, so here's the evidence. But the point is, we do not find any narration indicating that the Prophet Muhammad after every prayer raised his hands in dua. People say, this is picky. Why are you going to get so picky? You know? If it said that you raise your hands, Allah is trying not to give you he said the Prophet raised his hands in istisqa. Why can't we just do it after every prayer? Then what's the problem here? We say the Sunnah of the Prophet is not just what he did, but also what he didn't do. You have Sunnah fi'liya, the Sunnah of actions which he did, and Sunnah tarkiya, or Sunnah of actions which he didn't do, which are Religion, dealing with the religion. Of course, there are many things he didn't do which he didn't like, personally. We're not talking about those. We're talking about things connected with the religion. The things he didn't do, it is sunnah not to do. Very important. Because if one opens this door, that as long as he said this, he said that, we can put it all together and come up with something which he didn't do, then the religion becomes innovated. 
You can now change the religion at will. Because I can bring something to you. I say to you. Prophet Muhammad said. Prayer in jama'ah is worth 27 times prayer by yourself. Everybody knows this. He also said. Whenever you enter the masjid. You should pray two rak'at. Two units of prayer before sitting down. Everybody knows this. Let us put the two together. We come into the masjid. I now suggest to you. Let us make tahiyatul masjid in jama'ah. If I suggest that. What do people say? He said no 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 no. You can't do that. Why not? Prophet ﷺ said the prayer in jama'ah is worth more than the prayer by yourself. He also said, whenever you come in, you should do this two rakah. Why can't we put them together and do it? Well, the Prophet ﷺ didn't do it. That's why, yes. He didn't do it, so we cannot do it. He made tahajjud in jama'ah. This is also sunnah. And he did it in jama'ah. We can do it because he did it. But to do tahiyat al-masjid in jama'ah, or to do the sunnahs before zuhur, the sunnahs after zuhur in jama'ah, we can't do it because Prophet Muhammad ﷺ didn't do it. And that's emphasized by his well-known statement, مَا تَرَكْتُ شَيْئًا يُقَرِّبُكُمْ إِلَى اللَّهِ إِلَّا وَأَمَرْتُكُمْ بِهِ I didn't leave anything which would bring you closer to Allah without instructing you to do it. That's the bottom line. If it's going to bring you closer to Allah, Prophet Muhammad ﷺ told us to do it. If he didn't tell us to do it, it will not bring you closer to Allah, no matter how good you think this is, how, you know, how much reasoning you give behind it, it will not bring you closer to Allah. It will take you farther away from Allah. This is the basic principle, based on the statement of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, مَنْ أَحْدَثَ فِي أَمْرِنَا مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ فَهُوَ رَدْ Whoever introduces anything new in this religion of ours, not approved by Allah and by the Messenger of Allah, it is rejected. This is to protect the religion in its pristine purity. From change, deviation, etc. Like what happened to the other, religion, the other messages which were of Islam but became distorted in time like that of Christianity, Judaism, etc., etc.